Thank you for joining this presentation. Uh, the title is a little brash, uh, but this is mainly meant as a review talk with some sense of comparison for how we think of the Himalaya versus other contractional orogenic systems. We Himalayan folks commonly think in cross sections, so we'll start that way. Here I show some Google image search, search results for the Himalaya here, uh, for the Alps, for the Andes, and for Taiwan. Uh, so to my eyes, some expected things stand out. First, other contractional origins uh, involve mantle scale processes, and those are shown in the cross sections, whereas in the Himalaya, we commonly do not feature that. Uh, second, the third dimension is rather more commonly represented in other orogenic systems, uh, whereas, as I mentioned, we Himalayan folks tend to think in cross section. Um, Third, if you squint close, you'll see that thrust kinematics and duplexing are commonly seen to dominate deformation across the whole crust in most orogenic systems. In contrast, uh, that's not true in the Himalaya where we have the channel flow concept um, and a significant fraction of our orogenic architecture is thought to represent a former orogenic channel. Uh, so let's bring out those two first cross sections from the Himalayan search uh, because they're pretty typical. Uh, they involve big imbricate slabs to great depth. Uh, now we're going to tackle the Himalaya fault by fault, then in 3D, and that'll lead us to considering the mantle, and then we'll wrap up. So to start fault by fault, uh, let's note the, the major faults claims to bound these imbricate slices. There's the main frontal thrust, main boundary thrust, main central thrust, and South Tibet fault system uh, in both diagrams. Here's a map and a cross section from more recent literature. Uh, you can see a few of the uh, complications associated with those internal structures that are a bit hinted at here and here. Uh, admittedly, we know for the lesser Himalaya, uh, between the main central thrust and the main boundary thrust, uh, that there's a lot of duplexing there. Uh, nonetheless, let's tackle some of this simplicity, uh, starting with the main boundary thrust, which is interpreted to represent a major tectonic division between pre-Himalayan, lesser Himalayan strata, and Sin deformational sub Himalayan rocks. Note there's an implicit equality between structural and stratigraphic division, uh, which is not necessarily a wise decision. Uh, in short, there is no main boundary thrust. It's a bit of a myth. Let me show you why. It's easier to do in this area. So we zoom in. Uh, the line of section here is from here to here. Um, we'll zoom in just a little bit more. Uh, so you'll notice that the main boundary thrust entering uh, from the east is here. Uh, the main boundary thrust exiting from the west is there uh, and continues up this way. These are not the same structure. In cross section, they're very different. Uh, the Kroll thrust here and the Belasper thrust here are at very different structural levels. Uh, both of these faults are fitting the technical definition of putting one stratigraphy atop another. Uh, it's much more effective to simply recognize that the lesser Himalayan stratigraphy and the sub Himalayan stratigraphy together form a layered stratigraphy that is deformed in a fold thrust belt without any one fault dominating their juxtaposition. Uh, so Sean Long and Dee Robinson uh, implicitly made a similar point in a geology paper this year. Okay, let's turn our attention to the main central thrust. This structure is also not as singular as our common cross sections would lead us to believe. The recognition of faults within the crystalline core, which are progressively younger uh, at deeper structural positions leads to a classic duplex interpretation. Slices were progressively accreted from the foot wall to the hanging wall, forming a duplex. Uh, and the normal consequences of duplex development apply to the main central thrust. That is in the hinterland where the duplex is developed, it records its structural history in fragments, each strand having a progressively different part and younger part. Uh, all of that history is compounded into a single structure towards the foreland in this model. Uh, so the whole origin, this portion and this portion, appears to be formed by progressive accretion, much like any other fold thrust belt uh, with the same basic kinematic consequences. Uh, so these big blocks are not so structurally distinguishing as we might like to assume. Let's now turn our attention to the South Tibet Fault. Uh, here are the models seeking to explain the activity along the South Tibet Fault or the South Tibet Detachment System. Uh, it's supposed to be a large normal fault, which is true in all models uh, with this exception, uh, which our group has been associated with, in which it's a back thrust. Uh, 
Uh, note that in the map and cross section, well, in the cross section, it's now recognized uh, to feature at least two distinct elements, an upper and lower shear zone. So a lower shear zone and an upper fault. Uh, and the upper fault is distinctively north dipping and relatively discrete. The upper shear zone is, or the lower shear zone is warped throughout the orogenic system. Now, normal faults of the dominant South Tibet fault interpretation, normal faults are expected to have thermochronological signatures wherein the foot wall should show much younger cooling ages versus the hanging wall. The South Tibet fault does not match this pattern. So here it is for the central Nepal Himalaya in terms of compiled thermochronological data, almost exclusively argon muscovite ages, crossing the fault with no particular distinction in age. Uh, the same pattern here shown in the white circles is true for the Sutledge River region. Um, in both cases, the cooling ages across the fault are nearly identical, suggesting a flat fault rather than a dipping normal fault. Farther east, things do look a bit different. The South Tibet Fault uh, in its foot wall does have a dramatic late rapid cooling event, uh, and that cooling is from temperatures way higher than those recorded in the hanging wall, uh, and thus it does match the predictions of an expected normal fault, uh, and is interpreted to be a representation of the upper South Tibet Fault as articulated in the cross section here. Uh, now it's interesting to note that the map does not distinguish the upper and lower strands. Uh, and there's good reason for this. You try mapping them. Uh, a long strike would be really difficult because they're exposed along the range crest and it's impossible to walk the faults. Uh, and we will come back to uh, why uh, these faults appear distinctive. Uh, we can use the thermochronological signatures to speculate that the upper uh, brittle South Tibet Fault is restricted to the East Central Himalaya. And we'll come back to, uh, to explore why later. Now let's think about those models again for the South Tibet Fault and the emplacement of the crystalline core. They're all in two dimensions. Uh, key geological relationships suggest that there's a simple problem with that. Uh, this is ages seen along the South Tibet Fault. The greens are sin or pre-tectonic ages, and the oranges and reds are post-tectonic ages, such that interpolating between them as shown in the gray, gives the timing of South Tibet fault cessation. And it varies from the Western Himalaya through the Central Himalaya to the Eastern Himalaya, continuously younging. And there's a weak suggestion that it may get older again in the far Eastern Himalaya. So this is a major, a long strike heterogeneity in the South Tibet fault, the major, the major fault in those tectonic models uh, that were all cross-sectional. So the models are gonna need uh, more dimensions to them. Uh, interestingly, shallow intrusive rocks and volcanic rocks in the southern, in the northernmost Himalaya and southern Tibet show the same trends, young in from both ends of the origin towards the east central uh, Himalaya. Uh, there's a fair amount more, uh, but for today, the last spatiotemporal correlation I want to explore uh, is the downgoing Indian slab. We see here in slices, tomographic slices from the western Himalaya progressively to the central Himalaya, that this Indian anomaly thought to represent uh, lithosphere detached from the orogenic system has sunk farther below the 660 discontinuity in the west and progressively has sunk shallower uh, towards the central center of the origin, suggesting that it broke off earlier in the west and later in the east, progress suggesting a progressive lateral propagation of slab tearing. So we incorporate that element uh, into a model shown here, which is a kind of weird way to look at the Himalaya. Uh, I recommend that you imagine you are in Beijing, looking back at the range so that, such that this is the Western Himalaya, this is the Eastern Himalaya, but you are 500 kilometers above Beijing and it is 15 million years ago. And you can see through Tibet to the subducting Indian plate. In this case, you see a tear developing in the downgoing slab from the Eastern Syntaxis and another tear developing from the Western Syntaxis, both propagating inwards. So this tearing would cause isostatic and dynamic topographic and tectonic changes to the crustal convergence or genic system developing above uh, the tearing system, uh, which would include progressive along strike shutoff of South Tibet, intach, South Tibet fault activity. Uh, it would trigger South Tibetan magmatism via an influx of hot material uh, through these windows developing in the slab tears, uh, and uplift, exhumation, and cooling would result uh, as the weight of the downgoing slab is removed uh, from the system. I promise we come back to this. 
why is the inner, or, or sorry, the upper STD only seemingly developed in the east central Himalaya, according to the thermochrome we looked at earlier? Uh, perhaps that is because this is the zone of final slab detachment, uh, which may have relatively dramatic effects only in the east central Himalaya, including potentially a wedge extrusion system localized to that region. Okay, so let's gather our takeaway points. We started by noting that the Himalaya are seen a bit differently from other contractional orogenic systems in terms of being thought of as, whole, as a whole crustal imbricate fan, potentially preserving a ductal channel uh, versus a stacked series of duplexes. Uh, in terms of the third dimension, not necessarily mattering that much. And uh, in terms of our consideration of mantle dynamic evolution, not mattering that much for the crustal full thrust belt development. We went through the stack and we noted that actually it's all more complicated than that. The major thrusts are in fact complex composite structures uh, representing duplexing. Um, the third dimension does show significant variations and consideration of mantle dynamics appears to offer explanations for those third dimensional variations. We didn't dig into the details of the crustal implications of this 3D whole lithospheric model, uh, but you can check it out in our published work uh, as represented here uh, via cross-sectional evolutionary diagrams that look a lot more like orogenic systems worldwide uh, versus how we can uh, traditionally think of the Himalaya. For, for we Himalayan folks, we need to be spending more time paying attention to other orogenic systems uh, because while the model presented here looks completely odd for a Himalayan tectonic model, uh, similar models have been proposed for Alpine Mediterranean tectonics for over 20 years. Thank you very much for your attention.